Thank you very much. Thank you for everyone who stayed through this entire long day to see my last presentation. Um, so today I'm going to talk about some undergraduate research that I conducted at Colgate University um, looking at fertile sterile dimorphism in ferns. So first of all, I'd like to start some, with some acknowledgments. My advisor, shown there in the picture with a machete, um, <laughs> very strong hand in my biology education. Um, my co-advisor, Kat Carter-Luce, a couple of funding sources and some friends that helped me out along the way. Um, so I just want to start out talking about resource allocation theory. Essentially this idea that organisms have a finite resource pool to use. And they try and balance these resources between different processes such as growth, survival, and reproduction. They do this in order to maximize lifetime reproductive output or lifetime fitness. And having finite resources, al increasing allocation to one of these processes necessarily decreases the resources available to the others. Um, so there's trade-offs involved as a result of these finite resources. Differential selection among these processes can lead to dimorphism. And that's essentially this idea where there's two different mor or more morphologies or two different forms within a species. And this can be between individuals, such as male-female dimorphism, think of peacocks or a lot of spiders. Or it can be between different structures, such as male and female structures on the same plant, or even fertile versus sterile structures on the same plant. So thinking about flowers, flowers are essentially just modified leaves. Modified leaves, modified after millions of years of evolution, um, and they have this very different form and a very different function. But today I'm talking about ferns, a really amazing group of plants. And they're very interesting because they use their foliar structures as both a site for photosynthesis and reproduction. This creates a series of really novel trade-offs where they're in competition for not only resources, but also for space. The majority of ferns out there are termed monomorphic. That is the difference between sterile fronds and fertile fronds. They're morphologically similar, just that those fertile fronds have those sporangia. Um, but there are some ferns out there which are called holodimorphic, where that fertile frond becomes completely reduced. There's no longer any photosynthetic lamina on these fertile fronds. Their essentially sole purpose is for reproduction. There's also a lot of ferns that fall between these two extremes, where there's a difference between fertile and sterile fronds, but it's not exactly a complete reduction. A special case is termed hemidimorphism, where there is actual spatial segregation within the fertile frond of sterile and fertile tissues. This is a really neat example, it's called interrupted fern. It gets that name because the middle of these fertile fronds are completely reduced to sporangia, and you have sterile photosynthetic lamina on the top and bottom. So this series of life history strategies can be studied to really allow insights into the evolutionary processes that are really affecting reproduction in ferns. Um, specifically in what I'm gonna talk about today, we're gonna talk about physiological differences between fertile and sterile fronds, how manipulation of fertile and sterile fronds can influence future allocation patterns and source sync relationships within individuals. Um, so as for my study species, my first study species is Osmondastrum cinnamomium. It's called cinnamon fern. It's a holodimorphic fern. These fertile fronds are completely reduced. You can see them right there. There's no more photosynthetic lamina um, and, they're, um, and they're very, very large fertile fronds as well. The other fern I'm looking at is Osmunda regalis, it's known as a royal fern. It's hemidimorphic, where the only reproductive structures on the fertile frond is restricted to the very apex of the plant. And they're completely reduced to sporangia, but these basal pinnae are sterile and photosynthetic. Um, a couple of things of background with these ferns, they live in very high resource environments, high light environments. Um, they're very, very large. Some of these fronds can get almost two meters tall. Um, particularly in my field site. And they have chlorophyllous spores. That is, they have spores that are green and capable of photosynthesis. So as for my methods, the first thing I did is I looked at gas exchange between these plants using a Lycor 6400. About every two weeks, I looked at things like photosynthesis, respiration rates, and conductance. And I looked at sterile fronds, those fertile tissues. In the case of the hemidimorphic Osmunda regalis, that sterile lamina on that fertile frond. Um, I also looked at nitrogen content using elemental analysis. I collected plants every two weeks and looked at the nitrogen content, again, those sterile fronds, those fertile tissues, and those sterile lamina on the fertile fronds for regalis. I conducted a fern, uh, sorry, frond removal experiment where at the very beginning of the growing season, why these um, 
individuals still were all fiddleheads. I either cut off all the fertile fronds, <coughs> cut off all the sterile fronds, or left them as controls. There are 10 plants in each of these treatments for each species. And this allows me to kind of manipulate allocation in one season. And in subsequent seasons, I can see if that changes allocation patterns in the future. So to start out with what I found, just looking at photosynthetic rates. Uh, one thing you notice right away is these fertile fronds for uh, cinnamon fern, they don't even have a positive photosynthetic rate. And this is really driven by an extremely high respiration rate of these fertile fronds. Um, and the other thing you notice is these sterile fronds, they have a really high photosynthetic rate. For those of you that look at photosynthetic rates, this is extremely high for ferns in general, some of the highest values found. Um, and it may be required to have this extremely high photosynthetic rate to kind of offset these fertile fronds, which may be carbon costs. The only reason you see only two points here is because um, after spore release, those fertile fronds just die, and it happens very early on in the growing season. For royal fern, um, you see a very similar pattern. Again, those fertile fronds, the, the fertile tissues, excuse me, very, very low photosynthetic rates, really not significantly different from zero. Um, and what's really interesting is the sterile fronds and the sterile tissue on the fertile front have similar photosynthetic rates across the season and show the same pattern across the season as well. So really no difference between those. Looking at percent nitrogen, these ferns have extremely high nitrogen content. Particularly looking at this fertile frond, there's an extremely high investment of nitrogen into these fertile fronds. And following uh, spore dispersal, which is right around here, all that nitrogen drops away. And what that tells us is that this nitrogen allocation of fertile fronds is essentially all for reproduction. These plants can't gain this nitrogen back. So it's a, really a loss from the plant. Um, you'll notice a really, really high percent nitrogen for ferns in this first uh, measurement while they were still fiddleheads. And most ferns invest most of the nutrients that an entire frond will have in those fiddleheads, which is why they're so nutrient rich and so many animals like to eat them. Uh, looking at royal fern, you see the same pattern with the fertile tissue, very high investment of nitrogen, then following spore dispersal, which is right around in here, it drops down. Um, and again, similar to photosynthetic rates, those sterile fronds and those sterile tissues on the fertile fronds have very similar percent nitrogen across the growing season. The frond removal experiment had some really interesting results. Um, the control in black here has no real change across the three growing seasons in number of fertile fronds. Um, when we cut off all the fertile fronds, so essentially removing all that reproductive cost in 2009, there's an increase in the amount of fertile fronds that are produced in the subsequent season, which suggests that the production of fertile fronds are really a cost to these plants, because production of fertile fronds or reduction in the amount of fertile fronds produced can lead to future increase in allocation. And it also suggests that increasing the number of fertile fronds produced in this season may result in less resources available for frond production in 2011. And we see a very different pattern with sterile fronds removed in green here. Removing all the sterile fronds essentially removes any photosynthetic capacity for these plants in 2009. <coughs> so they're not able to gain any carbon over the course of this season. And as a result, they produce a lot less fertile fronds in 2010 and it kind of goes back up towards the control in 2011. Picture's a little bit messier for royal fern. Um, there seemed to be some effect of time across these three growing seasons. We didn't really see any obvious correlations, uh, but just some sort of environmental effect there. But what's really interesting is the pattern that frond removal had was essentially the same between fertile fronds and sterile fronds removed. By removing those, you do see this sharp decrease, which wasn't really different than the control. And then both those plants that had a initial um, removal of fronds resulted in increasing allocation to fertile fronds in 2011. Well, that was... <laughs> I just want you guys to really get this all down. <laughs> okay, so overall, when we're talking about cinnamon fern, it really seems very obvious these fertile fronds are extremely costly. They're costly in terms of nitrogen allocation. They're costly in terms of being net carbon losses. They're extremely large, so those patterns are essentially multiplied by the fact that these fronds are so big. Um, and it really shows us that they are costly in the fact that 
investment in fertile fronds does influence future reproductive allocation. Um, and this interseasonal effect really shows that resource storage is very important for these ferns. Looking at Asmunda regalis, it's very interesting. The sterile lamina on those fertile fronds and the sterile lamina on the sterile fronds, these two things are essentially physiologically the same. They have similar nitrogen contents, they have similar photosynthetic rates, and removal of either of those frond types has the same effect on the fern allocation in the future. So these fertile fronds may actually represent net carbon gains for the plant, that the photo high photosynthetic rates of these basal lamina essentially offset the carbon cost of that fertile apex. Uh, so then the real big question comes is, why be dimorphic? If it's so expensive in terms of carbon and nitrogen, why would any fern want to be dimorphic? And the answer is really in sexual specialization. Essentially by dividing two different fronds, one solely for reproduction and one solely for photosynthesis, you essentially remove this conflict of interest so that fertile fronds can essentially be selected for to increase reproductive output. And things that include is elevating spores higher into the wind column. It allows faster drying of spores, which is necessary for spore dispersal. <coughs> Greater exposure to wind leads to farther dispersal and less, um, less constriction by uh, sterile fronds around it. And there can be temporal selection as well. Both these plants have a very early dispersal of spores compared to many monomorphic species. And it may be that early on in the growing season when it's still spring, there's more open habitat for establishment and there's more rainfall for better conditions for establishment. And then sterile fronds can be selected for better photosynthesis, being more horizontal to get better um, interception of sunlight, maybe growing closer to the substrate where there may be higher humidity or higher CO2 concentrations, which happen in a lot of environments, um, which would be which would be a negative impact in terms of reproduction. So really dividing those fronds out would be very beneficial. So thinking about the evolution of ferns, um, holodim holodimorphism is extremely rare in ferns. Monomorphism is really the rule and holodimorphism is the exception. And it could just be because that in holodimorphic ferns, these fertile fronds are extremely costly. Lots of carbon needed, lots of nitrogen. In order to deal with those costs, ferns may need high nutrient environments, high light environments for high photosynthesis. Um, and ferns as a group overall really don't inhabit those high resource environments. They're out competed by seed plants. Um, so it may be that in the past, dimorphism was a lot more common in ferns as a group, um, but it may be too costly for most of their environments that they're restricted to now. And what's really interesting, we found a really important um, requirement for storage, particularly in these seasonal ferns in upstate New York. Um, but there's a lot of dimorphic ferns in the canopy and tropical environments. They may have a different method to deal with these high costs, which would be interesting to look into. Uh, with that, I have my literature cited, and I'll be happy to take any questions. <coughs> It certainly makes sense that, that, that elevating the, the fertile part would allow the spores to disperse farther, but then what do you think is going on with that interrupted fern where it puts the fertile part below the photosynthetic part? I'm not actually sure. Um, with that particular plant, it's actually in the same family as these two ferns that I studied. Um, those fertile fronds are produced generally before sterile fronds. Um, so essentially those fertile fronds are produced and sterile fronds are produced later on in the growing season. And it may be a more temporal effect that by only having fertile fronds to start out with, there's less, um, there's less interference with those other fronds around. It also could be some sort of um, adaptation. There may be a disadvantage to having your spores so high up, it might be more likely to be damaged or eaten by a herbivory. But I'm not actually sure. It's an odd fern, which is why I like it. Put it up there. Any other question? Um, those ferns are beautiful. I really like them. And they live in the northern temperate forest, right? You, you can find them down here, too. They have really large distribution. Right, right. I was going to ask if herbivory in one season 
affects the growth that season or the next season? What do you think? I'm not actually sure. Working with his plants, I didn't actually see a lot of evidence of river green. I'm not sure if they had high defense as well. They lived in, particularly in my site, they lived in really, really high nutrient soils that were on the periphery of this pond with a lot of water as well. So they may have a lot of resources to invest in defense. But um, judging by just the effect of removing those different ponds, I would imagine that it could uh, maybe affect the Maybe it's just a pond removal. Okay. All right, I guess that's all the time we have for questions.